We've also provided a closed caption link in the chat box. We will attempt to address questions after each session. However, due to the tight schedule, questions not addressed will be followed up with a Q&A document posted to the event website following the event. Please provide comments and interact with other attendees in the chat box, but please ensure that all questions for the presenters are provided in the Q&A box so that we don't miss them. If you have trouble with your audio or video while in Zoom, please refresh your page or try logging out and logging back in. You won't disturb anyone else by doing so. Also, you can adjust your screen ratio using the view options drop down at the top of your Zoom window. Your attendance will be documented as you log in using your link. Um, so there's no reason to chat us of your attendance. We know you're here and, and thank you for being here. You will receive your COPs via email um, within the next few weeks. So you'll get a different certificate for each day and that will be emailed to the email address that you registered with and that you used to log into Zoom. If you do not receive that, that certificate within a few weeks, uh, feel free to email us at the email address found on our website. We will have a few polls today, so please make sure to respond and stay engaged. Let's see who, who all we have in the audience today. I'm gonna launch this poll. All right. Let us know whether you represent industry, government, state government, local government, your association member, or with the press and media. We've asked the same poll every day and the federal government has won out and it looks like they are winning again today. And then uh, second question at the bottom is, what is your role within that organization? Acquisition, contracting or procurement, program management, you're with industry or other. Um, and again, we've asked the same question every day. I'm sharing these results with you all now. Um, federal government is predominantly here today with uh, quite a few from industry. We also have mostly folks in acquisition, contracting and procurement, some program managers, some industry and some others. And we appreciate each and every one of you being here. All right, Mary, back to you. Thanks, Shonda. So today to start off the event, I would like to introduce Ms. Penny Grout, GSA Acting Regional Administrator, and Exodi Rowe, Associate Administrator for GSA's Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. Penny is currently serving as Acting Regional Administrator, supporting GSA stakeholders in the Rocky Mountain region. Concurrently, she's serving as GSA's Federal Acquisition Service Regional Commissioner, leading regional teams supporting mission enablement for local defense and civilian agencies. Throughout her more than 20 years of public service, Penny has demonstrated an understanding of and a commitment to the stakeholders that she supports. Penny is helping advance GSA's Equity Action Plan, leading the Federal Acquisition Service in developing a robust post-award engagement strategy to help small businesses successfully compete in the federal marketplace. Exodi serves as the chief advocate for small and disadvantaged, disadvantaged businesses at GSA. In this role, Exodi helps the small business community access the agency's procurement opportunities, connect with federal contracting experts, receive counseling and training on the federal procurement process, connect with qualified federal suppliers to gain federal expertise. And he also serves as the vice chair on the Federal Small Disadvantaged Business Utilization Directors Interagency Council, a venue that exchanges best practices, strategies, and initiatives that other agencies are using to help businesses not only get a federal contract, but be able to successfully compete in the federal marketplace. Penny and Exodi will share some of the work GSA, GSA has in play to make it easier for small businesses. Penny and Exodi, the floor is yours. Hello and welcome. My name is Penny Grout and I am here with Exodi Rowe. And we are here today to discuss some of the initi initiatives we are leading in GSA to increase equity in our federal procurements. 
Exodi and I are excited to share some of the work that GSA has in play to make it easier for small businesses to get into the federal marketplace and then be successful once they are on board. Exodi, let's get started. The first step in tackling this challenge is understanding what small businesses need and what they are experiencing when they attempt to access or engage in the federal marketplace. So Exodi, what have we discovered about the current state? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for that, Penny. Good afternoon uh, to everyone present today. Um, in response to you, Penny, so currently we've conducted and are continuing to conduct research to gauge insight into the challenges you know, that small business owners are experiencing with navigating the federal procurement uh, marketplace. We're also evaluating what users are saying about the experience and what some of the barriers are that keep small businesses from uh, succeeding. Some of the feedback isn't new. Uh, they don't understand the language of government and the processes are complicated and tough to navigate. Many have opted out trying to figure out and find themselves paying a third party to help them, which, you know, we never encourage that. We really do try to make sure that they know about the OSBOOs, that they know about the PTACs, um, that they know about all these great uh, free resources that are there to really assist them. Um, they've also communicated to us about sometimes the challenges with understanding the regulatory requirements, particularly in the area of IT. So as part of GSA's Equity Action Plan, we've identified five pain points or barriers, which include one, navigating and complying with government IT requirements, two, navigating the multiple award schedule procurement and award process, and understanding regulatory requirements in the federal procurement landscape. Three, securing trained personnel to educate small businesses on how to successfully compete for tasks and delivery orders, comply with contract requirements, and satisfy the buyers and the end users. Four, accessing government-wide multiple agency contracts with limited onboarding opportunities. And five, navigating across multiple agency sites to find potential uh, opportunities. So we are currently developing our strategic action plans to overcome those five challenges. So for example, Ozbu is an active participant in increasing diversity by leading and supporting three of the five equity and procurement initiatives. These include establishing a robust post-award engagement strategy, which we're very excited about to help small businesses uh, contractors be successful. Two, we're enhancing our e-tools. We're making it easier for small businesses to evaluate federal opportunities by expanding the use of GSA's forecast of contracting opportunities tool. And three, we're developing a supplier diversity plan. We're working with uh, OGP and we're including a strategy and criteria for regular on-ramping on GWACs and major government-wide multiple award contracts. Thanks, Exodi. So based on the feedback we have received from our industry partners, GSA has already made some improvements. We recently updated the multiple award schedule roadmap. This website has been enhanced and now provides a step-by-step -step process for obtaining a scheduled contract. And a key improvement is the fact that it is written in an easy to follow format. Um, GSA has also launched the Vendor Support Center so that all prospective and current scheduled contract holders can find information and the resources they need to do business with the government. And importantly, GSA has awarded the 8A Stars 3 contract. This government-wide acquisition contract is an 8A set-aside that is focused on the customized IT solutions. Currently, GSA has awarded contracts to about 1,100 8A companies through this vehicle, and our intention is to onboard the broadest number of small businesses over time. So Exodi, you mentioned that one of the challenges that small businesses face is a lack of understanding of government language. So what are we doing to overcome the language barrier? Great question. Uh, as you mentioned, we've, we've received feedback from small businesses in the supplier community that our GSA web pages go into many different acronyms, platforms, and government jargon that's difficult to understand and follow. Having all the information in the world doesn't do any good if people don't understand what it says. So we're working to change this norm of using too much government lingo across the GSA websites into plain uh, language in accordance with the Plain Language Act. The purpose of this act is literally to improve the effectiveness and accountability of federal agencies to the public by promoting clear, 
government communication that the public can understand and use. So we've developed and included plain language guidelines in our training courses, which include how to do business with GSA, marketing your GSA contracts, SAM.gov contract data bank demonstrations. And we've also developed fact sheets on different topics to help small businesses understand information related to federal procurement in plain language, which can be accessed by visiting gsa.gov backslash Ozdaboo fact sheets. Again, that's gsa.gov backslash Ozdaboo fact sheets. I'm also excited to announce and to extend an invitation to everyone here um, that we are hosting our second annual Small Business Works 2022 event from July 26th through the 27th. Um, this is a two-day virtual event that will provide opportunities for, small, for the small business community and for the federal acquisition workforce. The event will offer several free workshops that will provide valuable and vital information to help small businesses navigate the federal government marketplace. So on July 26th, small businesses will be able to expand their network during the afternoon matchmaking event and also get valuable training. And then on the second day, on July 27th, it's all about the acquisition workforce. We'll be providing a lot of great uh, training uh, and talking about equity and procurement for the acquisition workforce. So again, details for this event can be found by visiting gsa.gov backslash small business works. It's great to hear about the agency's investment in staying connected with the small business community. In addition to maintaining dialogue with our industry partners and stakeholders, we are leveraging the data we have available across GSA and the government marketplace. We know we gain impactful insights when we more deeply understand the government marketplace, disaggregate data. So in addition to reporting at the socioeconomic category level, analyzing and understanding the data released by SBA that compared economy-wide shares of spend by business owner race and ethnicity to their shares of federal procurement dollars. And we're also combining data sets to inform action planning. For example, pairing existing procurement data from FPDS with census data, labor data, and SAM.gov to uncover, to uncover the concentration of spend, the levels of diversification, and year-over-year -year trends. And then we're using AI and visualization tools to help ingest and analyze the data and mature our business analytics. Through this process, one of the gaps we identified is the disparity between incumbent small businesses and new contract holders when it comes to successfully competing for opportunities. Exodi, what are the steps GSA is taking to use data to assess and address the gaps? Well, GSA has been charged with establishing an enterprise wide robust post-award engagement strategy to help small businesses be successful uh, through their GSA contract vehicles. The PAE team, post-award engagement team for short, uh, will also focus on developing interventions to address the root cause challenges that small businesses face as identified in the equity action plan and uh, qualitative surveys. The team will use the data to evaluate the impact and success of tactics and strategies that are implemented as part of the plan to support our small business community. This includes evaluating the success of new entrants within the socioeconomic small business community, along with those small businesses that are not meeting the minimum sales criteria under their GSA schedule contract. So we will not only develop activities, but we will use the data to gauge and track our success and progress. Our equity action plans at GSA and across government aren't just words on a page, they really reflect action because when we increase diversity in the federal marketplace, we drive more value for taxpayers and better mission outcomes for communities nationwide. The cross-agency work in this space is truly exciting. I'm very proud to be a part of it. Through a whole government approach, we have the opportunity to transform not only the underrepresented business owners and the small business sector, but the overall economy. I come from a family of entrepreneurs, so I'm very passionate about advocating for American small businesses I hope to inspire others to do the same. Yeah, I agree, Exodi. It's definitely the right work and it's exciting to be a part of the transformation. So GSA has already executed in key areas such as the enhancements to the mass roadmap and more regular onboarding of industry partners for our GWACs. These activities accelerate our progress in this area. 
and we are working to develop an action plan for key activities and tactics to engage industry partners and assist them with overcoming challenges and roadblocks. We know this may lead to changes in our processes and activities, and change is hard. So we may encounter some barriers as we execute our plan. And then settling on the right activities and tactics to have a positive result may also be challenging. What do you see as barriers to the work in front of GSA, Exodi? Well, Pity, we've heard that many small businesses need help, not just when they're first breaking into the federal marketplace, but after they get on the contract vehicle. That's a crucial moment for them to make good first impressions and develop a track record. And we'll soon be rolling out new ways to support that critical next step. Uh, and as our administrator says, we need to make the websites work. It should be easy for small businesses to sell to the government without navigating a bunch of forms and sites. We've been doing a lot of testing with business owners and we plan to address this challenge. You know, we're not just your customers, you're also our customer. And I should note that we've taken the same approach from the buying in for our federal partners who are here today, who should check out buy.gsa.gov if you haven't already. Thanks, Exodi. Um, now let's take a moment to hear from our audience. Shonda, let's ask the audience what they think is the biggest barrier to advancing equity in the federal procurement. Hey, Penny, we're going to let Shonda get that ready. Uh, we're going to be doing a, what we call a chatter fall. And so we will open the chat back up and then um, ask the questions. But don't type yet. Don't push enter or return until we say to push enter or return. So we're going to ask you a question. And Shonda, you can take it from here. Okay, go ahead, Adam, do the next slide, which is our question. Do not press enter or return until we say go. What do you see as the biggest barrier to advancing equity in the federal marketplace? Go. Great. Excellent. Wow. You guys are on fire. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, and do we have a second question, Adam? Take a pause. Our next question. Oh. Nope. That's it. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great way to capture the feedback from the audience. And we will have an email following this up with a word cloud, which has a visual of all of the responses. Um, and it's really a great way for others in government to see what everyone is thinking at other agencies. So I'm gonna, send it right back over to you, Penny. That was kind of fun. Sorry for the few little glitches that were in there, but that was very fun. We're still getting responses. So I'm gonna put on the chat and chatterfall and Penny, back to you. All right, thank you. So thanks to all for participating in the chatterfall. It's helpful to understand your perspectives to inform what we tackle and when. Today you have heard about some of the work that GSA is doing to meet the goals that were established within our agency's equity plan. Ultimately, we wanna enhance the federal marketplace and ensure that is robust, vibrant, and equitable. We have already started working on this through some of the work we shared with you in improving the math roadmap, more regular onboarding, and awarding contracts focused on small business. And now we're concentrating on our post-award engagement strategy. 
GSA has established an integrated project team, and this team is using qualitative and quantitative data to establish the tools, tactics, and activities that will be implemented to remove barriers and ease the challenges that our small business industry partners have faced. I would be remiss if I did not do some calls to action. So for our federal acquisition workforce, I wanna point out the small disadvantaged business goals have been increased for many agencies. For example, GSA's agency-wide prime contracting goal for SDVs historically has been 5%, but this has been increased this year to 21%. And chances are for your agencies, they've also been increased. <clears throat> These goals are ambitious, but that is exactly what is needed to advance equity and procurement. We need the federal acquisition workforce to do your part to maximize small business utilization to meet and hopefully exceed these goals. This is how we put equity into action by creating tangible opportunities for our small business community. It all starts with a strong partnership between OSBUs across the government and the acquisition workforce. For the small business community, I encourage you to stay connected with us. To learn more about free training opportunities and events, visit gsa.gov backslash OSDBU. You can also check out our forecast of contracting opportunities tool at fbf.gov. This tool makes it easier for small businesses to locate planned contracting opportunities with federal agencies. And last, remember to join us for the Small Business Works event on July 26th and 27th. You can register for this event and find information for other monthly free training courses at gsa.gov backslash, backslash OSBU events. So we have really enjoyed the opportunity to talk with you today, and we appreciate your active participation and feedback. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Back to you, Marie, Mary. <laughs> Thank you, Penny. No problem. My name is, oh, it's done all the time. I appreciate you, Penny and Exodi. I think that Chatterfall is cool because of the interaction that we're able to get, but I also know how much at GSA we really enjoy hearing from our agency partners and our industry partners. And it sounds like there's a lot of great things happening for small business out there right now. So uh, please do reach out to them, attend those things. That's awesome. Next up, I'm going to, it's my pleasure to introduce our next presenters, Joni Newhart, who is the OFPP Associate Administrator for Acquisition and Christine Heibeck, who is the Learning and Development Project Manager at the Federal Acquisition Institute. These ladies will best acquisition workforce. Thank you so much. We are so glad to be here today. Um, so we're doing a lot in this space regarding the acquisition workforce. I loved hearing what Penny and Exodi had to say and thanks for your help in working with our folks to, to strengthen them and make sure we support them in the equity goals. But we're supporting them in a lot more ways than, than just that from our office and with the Federal Acquisition Institute. Just to name a few areas, we used to focus primarily on training and development, but now we're, we're more holistic. So we're looking at, we hear a lot about talent pipelines that agencies need to get some new folks in. For example, we have a working on a, a shared hiring certificate for entry level contract specialists across the government. If you haven't heard of this and you have some positions in your office, please reach out to me because this cert is going to be open for a whole year and it's a great opportunity to get some new, fresh and vibrant folks in. We're looking forward to that piece. Another piece is um, working on the culture of the individual contracting offices to build uh, and foster innovation and innovative practices. We have a lot of resources in this area, uh, so you'll hear more about that. And then the last but not least piece is We've talked to a lot of frontline contracting folks and heard how important the networking is. So somebody new coming into the government really wants to share that experience 
with other people in different agencies doing contracting or in acquisition. So we're gonna explore opportunities to get these folks together and, and let them go through this journey together. As you know, acquisition is a wonderful, wonderful career. So we're gonna be putting some things in place to better support these really, really critical folks. One of the most important pieces is what uh, Chris is gonna cover here shortly. It's modernizing the federal acquisition certification and contracting. We haven't exactly determined our path, um, but Chris will tell you about it. And uh, let me turn it over to Chris and you will love hearing from her. Thanks, Joni. Um, so excited to be with you all today. Um, many, of you, um, many of you may have heard that um, DOD recently um, uh, changed their uh, certification, their DeWea certification programs. Um, and they really instituted a program called Back to Basics, and it became effective in February of this year. And at FAI, Federal Acquisition Institute and OFPP, we've been working with work groups um, within your agencies and across the federal sector to talk about how do we modernize the FACT um, certification program for acquisition um, and make it relevant and timely and most important, um, build you up and support you. And so we're looking at the DAU model and I was, I'm here today to kind of explain a little bit of what um, that model looks like and the recommendations that we have towards um, moving towards alignment uh, with DEWEA. Um, as many of those who know, um, you know the FACC, the FACC program, uh, Federal Acquisition Certification and Contracting, has aligned with the DeWea contracting certification um, pretty closely. And so uh, we're, uh, I wanted to share with you today the, do, the new contracting certification framework. And I know we have some program managers out there and some CORs. Um, and so I don't want you to think we're not looking at your program. Uh, we are, but today we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk primarily about the new contracting framework. Um, so one of the things that uh, DAU did and DOD did is they looked at the how at, at, at the age of the DeWIA program and they determined that, hey, you know what, this is about, DeWIA started about the same time as the cell phone and our three level certification program and why there's been some curriculum updates, it's pretty much remained kind of constant. And when, as an acquisition workforce, we think about the beginning of the cell phone to what we have today with our mini computers that we all have, um, and we don't go away, we don't go anywhere without. Um, the cell phones changed a lot in 30 years, and so DoD looked to say how how can we update our model so that we concentrate on lifelong learning? And so one of the things that they have started to do, and I'm going to kind of go from left to right, is they looked at how to update the required education. And so for 1102s, which are our contracting specialist, contracting officer series, they're really gonna require a bachelor's degree. And um, they kind of removed the certification requirement, the education requirement, the certification, recognizing that there are other members of the workforce that sometimes need a certification in contracting. So um, they are, they concentrate on that 1102 higher for bachelor's degree. Um, they looked at a new competency model. And so um, one of the things that we recognized was that in our current competency model, our DOD's current company model, they didn't always have that industry perspective. And I know we have some people from industry here, so you're excited to hear about that. So they've added that industry perspective as part of the competency model for the federal workforce. And um, they um, looked at the NCMA model and said that that mirrored closely and we can kind of align with an industry standard. And so now the DOD competency model and the NCMA model are very similar. Um, and um, it allows, uh, the goal is that we're all working towards the same kind of building block foundational competencies to allow that talent flow. So here's the big change, okay? so. The big change was we, we had three levels of certification, level one, two, and three for contracting. And in February, DOD went to a one level professional certification for contracting um, with really a goal to have the 
this certification be a focus on the basics and be a professional, um, be very similar to industry standards as far as having a pro one professional certification for a profession. And along with that new certification is the update in curriculum. So the new curriculum is based on uh, four classes that primarily um, mimic the acquisition workforce, um, the acquisition life cycle, excuse me. Um, they are the talking about the general principles of FAR and the general principles of acquisition and procurement. And then there's a pre-award, award and contract post-award contract administration course. And that's to provide that foundational knowledge um, to, for our workforce. And then the new requirement, another new requirement for uh, uh, moving forward will be a new professional certification exam. This is a professional exam that you'll go take closed book. It's about a three hours you'll have to take it. And it's on what we believe should be kind of this general base knowledge that you should have to practice and license as a contracting uh, professional. So that's the exciting certification changes. And so after the one level of certification, one of the things that uh, we recognize, our DOD recognize and we're recognizing as well is we have an extremely diverse federal acquisition workforce that has many missions and support many areas. And one contracting office does not necessarily need the same skills as a another contracting office. And so, we want to get the right training to the right people at the time of need. And so looking at developing credential training packages. And so after you become professionally certified, your role, your next thing would be that there would be credentials that would support you depending on your specific contracting need. Maybe you buy services. There would be a service credential. Maybe you buy construction or architectural engineering. There's a construction credential, con contracting construction credential. Maybe um, you're doing contract administration. And so there would be a contract administration or you're doing uh, major um, you know, pricing analysis and you're on a cost team. So these credentials would uh, be smaller chunk training that provides and concentrate on specific needs. And that will be part of the legacy workforce. So the legacy workforce, if you're currently certified, you'll remain certified. Um, and DOD, they remain certified, but credentials are now an opportunity for professional development for the legacy workforce. And the good news is there's no change to the continuous learning requirement. We're still gonna be vested in making sure that our acquisition workforce is able to receive professional training every two years. Um, so I just want to kind of, uh, this is my visual graph. This is my who, what, and how uh, graph for, uh, for those that learn a little differently. So nature of the change really is competency model that, in, that adds the seller's perspective. Um, a new training model. So the new training classes are a little differently. They're uh, based on more of a kind of a college type of atmosphere for DOD. Uh, DAU presents them over the course of a month with like office hours and asynchronous assignments, which means you get to, you know, read and do your own assignment. And then there's, you know, synchronous meetings in which you do group work and projects and have um, instructional uh, time with a, a professor virtually. Um, we've redefined the certification requirements. Uh, to be focused on a professional certification tied then with um, credentials. And the goal of all of this is to support lifelong learning. Um, one of the things that I wanted to make sure everyone knows is that under the DOD model, and as, as we're looking at this from a federal model as well, is that if you're currently DEWIA certified at the change of this in February, you still remained certified, your certification remains, there was no additional work for you to become, to stay certified. You just now have the opportunity um, to take and earn credentials as part of your professional development and continuous learning cycle. 
So the real change is for the new acquisition workforce of the future, the acquisition and workforce that would be coming in, they'll be the ones that will uh, have the new certification requirements, um, the new courses, and have uh, a new professional exam that is like the capstone of their um, of the curriculum. And then they move on to credential training. So some big changes happening in, in uh, DOD uh, back to basics as I mentioned. And so just wanted to share that we are looking at how to train the acquisition workforce and how to improve that training to get to the right training at the right time um, to support your growth and your awareness. And so we do want to take some questions. I know some of you probably are coming in with questions. Um, Shonda, do we have uh, any good questions uh, to share? <clears throat> yes, we do actually. Um, um, Peter asked, um, is the revised contract and certification that you were describing only available to government employees at this time? Um, actually, right now, the revised certification is applies to Department of Defense employees at this time. Um, but we are looking for that it would that the certification um, we are looking to uh, update the FACC certification, which is the federal certification. And that is that federal certification right now is only available to federal government employees. Okay. Um, we have another question. Um, can state or local governments um, access the training offered by DAU or FAI? Um, that's a great question. And I'm going to... Um, I will definitely do a little bit more research on, on that. I recently was talking to DAU um, and they are looking to allow, um, to extend their curriculum to be open to us, uh, to uh, other, to state and local governments um, and maybe some industry. Um, at, and they're the ones that currently have the curriculum. So I have to kind of follow up on that one as to um, how you would go about getting that, so. I, I can provide more clarity on that answer uh, in the written section. Okay. Um, to what extent do you foresee the credentials as a, just a repackaging of previous level two and three courses that somebody might have already had? Eric, that is a great question. Um, I actually think that it's it's primarily going to be um, new courses. It's not necessarily going to be your CON 280, 290 course or your CON 360 course. These are really going to be much more technically focused areas of training. Um, for example, there's a construction contracting credential. That class will have maybe a similar course to our current CON 244, um, if you're uh, familiar with that curriculum. But it also has a new class added um, and some additional continuous learning models. So the, the goal of the credential is really to provide that right size training at the right time to support very specific missions. As I said, like maybe you're doing some hard pr uh, price analysis. Uh, DAU is planning on having around, um, around 10 different pricing credentials service credential, small purchase credential, um, advanced simplified acquisition procedure credential. At FAI, we're also looking at maybe an in a, in a acquisition innovation credential. So I definitely think it'll be a difference in, in uh, training. Okay, um, we have quite a few questions about uh, recertification. I know that you touched on that briefly, but can you reiterate that if we're already um, certified, will this impact us? And also, how does this impact like a COR certification? So, uh, yes, if you are currently uh, DEWEA certified, you remain certified. If you are currently FACC certified, that's for contracting, you're going to remain certified as we update that. We're, we're all committed to that your, your earned certification will stay current and uh, you'll be moved into the new program and there'll just be credential opportunities available for you. For the core program, um, you know, we're gonna look at the core program, but right now there's no um, schedule change 
Uh, there is currently core certification training available. Um, so there's no current, there's no schedule change right now for that. So more to come on that um, as we move forward. So okay, there's lots of questions. We need to have a few more uh, a few more minutes. Um, can you repeat? Did you say that a bachelor's degree would no longer be required for FACSI certification? So currently for FACSI certification. Uh, there's two things. One is a bachelor's degree, or you can have 24 business credit hours. Mm -hmm. uh, DAU has changed that to 1102s. All 1102s hired at um, within DOD will need a bachelor's degree. Um, for the federal acquisition certification, we are looking at a model in which we would either have a bachelor's degree or 24 business credits for that GS5 through 12 position and probably a bachelor's degree for the GS-13 and above. Okay. Um, will the CLP requirements change due to this change? Nope. The CLP requirements stay the same. Um, it is um, the commitment of, to maintaining. We, we know that contracting and acquisition in the federal, the federal sector is diverse and dynamic and there is a lot of change that happens and we have to have our workforce stay current. Um, if anything, this model is to encourage and enhance lifelong learning. Um, acquisition professionals need to embrace being lifelong learners. That is absolutely true. Is there a website that you can provide, um, even if you say it out loud, we can type it in the chat where people can go to learn more about this. There's a lot of, uh, I've, got, I've got 20 additional open questions and I know we don't have time for all that. So maybe you have a reference for us. Yeah, Adam, if you could move back to the slide um, with the little visual chart. At the bottom of that slide, it has the DAU contracting certification webpage back to basics. I know the slides are gonna be sent. Um, Chandra, I will send you a link that you can put in the chat later. Okay. Um, um, that, but it's on, if you, if you Google the DAU webpage, Back to Basics, you guys will be there. They have a lot of great information about their Back to Basics. Um, there's a specific page for contracting um, and I really encourage you to check it out. Okay, well, thank you. We, uh, you're gonna have a lot of follow-up questions, I'm afraid. So uh, just be prepared. I know this is a hot topic for, for a lot of our attendees. So thank you both so much uh, for the wonderful information. Uh, it's very, very interesting that this has changed after all these years. Um, all right, thank you both. And Mary, back to you. Thanks, Shonda. Wow, you guys are very engaged on this subject. So we really like to hear that and see that in these events. Um, the link to the dau.edu back to basics has been posted in the chat. So go grab that and copy and paste it. There's more you can learn. And we will answer all of the questions in a document that will follow after the event. Okay, so let's get on to some more good stuff. Next up on the agenda, we have Scott Pace from D DCMA, the Defense Contract Management Agency, to tell us about DCMA's commercial item group or known as CIG, SIG. Scott, the floor is yours. All right, very good, thank you. Quick mic check. You sound great. All right, sounds good. So I will share my screen, take control here. All right, Perfect. you should see Looks my, uh, yeah, Looks my home screen. Guy. Very good. So good afternoon from sunny Colorado. Um, go Avalanche for those of you that follow the NHL and Stanley Cup playoffs. Uh, it's exciting for us here. Um, so this session is titled Partnering for Success with the DCMA Commercial Item Group. And so you can probably infer from the title that we'll be talking about products and services and more specifically commercial acquisitions for the Department of Defense. All right, so I am a lead engineer with the commercial item group. Um, so I'm hitting my 15 year mark here in early July. And uh, Shonda, let's go to the polls. Um, 
So this is likely a different audience than we typically engage with. Um, so we have a couple simple polling questions trying to gauge the interest uh, that we have here. So I'll give it a moment here, but um, so whether you offer cables, bearings, IMUs, CPUs, um, wheels, brakes, um, regardless of what the offering is from an industry perspective, there's a good chance that the DOD is interested in what you have to offer. And what, one of the missions that we have is to drum up interest and make sure that the appropriate parties are aware of uh, DOD commercial acquisitions. All right, so we got some polling results here. Um, lots of folks in attendance, plenty that are interested and currently do provide um, commercial products and services for the DOD. There are some that don't and are interested. So that, that is kind of the target audience. We wanna make sure you're aware of the resources you have available to us. And um, we, we do have an office hours that is an ongoing meeting. I'll address within this presentation and uh, we can get you engaged in that if you're interested. All right, very good. Thank you, Shonda. I think I'm one, one too far. Okay, so agenda, first off. So th th this is a short segment. We have about 15 minutes here. So we have lots to talk about. Uh, I'm just gonna hit on a couple of the key points and concepts and give you avenues to interface with us going forward. Um, so we'll start off with a quick introduction of the DCMA Commercial Lighting Group. Uh, we'll talk about our mission, discuss the triggers um, for the commercial item group involvement in acquisitions, talk about a brief overview of commercial regulations and what guides our reviews and is pertinent to industry as well. Um, we'll give a brief overview of the um, commercial regulations, touched on that already, um, and share some publicly available commercial products and services tools. Um, and resources that you can tap into, give some links, the slides will be shared so you can reference those going forward. And um, finally, just an invitation for further interaction. If you wanna take this offline, talk to us directly, there are some links and sources to do so. All right, so some of the terms, um, can be confusing. So the FAR now recognizes the terms products and services in lieu of what was formerly called items. So we're gonna stick with the name commercial item group. It's well known through our industry and it just sounds better than commercial products and services group. Um, so just know that the definitions are largely unchanged and the, the definitions have the same connotation between items and products and services. Um, so we have engineers and the engineers are charged with providing recommendations of commercial product and service uh, status. We have price cost analysts and they review the commercial product and service for fair and reasonable pricing. And then finally, we have contracting officers and we have three currently and that, that number changes depending on when you ask. Um, but they're ultimately the few that hold the warrants that determine a product or service as commercial. So the uh, procurement contracting officers um, within the program offices also hold this authority and they may determine a product or service commercial on their own. All right, our mission. So our mission is to provide acquisition insight for the integration of commercial products and services within DOD to streamline procurements and ensure warfighters receive cutting edge technology at a fair and reasonable price. So what are the benefits to a contractor to have a product and service determined commercial? Well, first and foremost, so it eliminates the process of providing certified cost and pricing data. So it's a, a TNET 
exemption. Um, and this means there must be a sufficient market um, you know, pricing information available that is obtainable and we can verify to arrive at a fair and reasonable price. So additionally, commercial products and services can be contracted under FAR Part 12. And FAR Part 12 procedures are much simplified and streamlined um, than FAR Part 15, which is contract by negotiations and can take a lot of the terms and conditions and, and nuances of government oversight out of the equation. All right, so we get involved primarily upon request from our DOD customers. And so we have program offices that reach out and we are considered the cadre of experts, a fairly small group. And um, this is all we do. And, and, and so we have a lot of experience and um, case turnover where we understand the different conditions that may um, arise. So our services to our customers are market research, uh, commerciality, technical reviews, um, commercial item determinations, and fair and reasonable pricing analysis. So th this preferably comes from market pricing rather than cost buildup or historical government purchase pricing. So that, that's our primary function. Um, secondarily, what we consider hot topics and initiatives is um, other things that we believe have a longer term outlook to move the needle and to um, encourage uh, commercial acquisitions. Um, some of these examples would be uh, industry re requests. We've had a couple of pilots, um, I think two solicitations um, that we've had to date um, where we've asked industry if they have something to offer the DOD that could be a potential interest and we review, perform the review and issue a commercial item determination based on that information. Um, that kind of goes hand in hand with the proactive commercial item determinations. When we're doing our independent market research, often we come across items that have not been asserted as commercial, but we find to be commercial. And so we preemptively issue a commercial item determination for those items. So when and if in the future they come up in a DOD acquisition, they already have the commercial item determination. And so it bypasses a lot of the groundwork um, um, to, you know, to verify that they are in fact commercial. We also perform uh, pricing white papers. Um, you know, as we spend a lot of time with different um, uh, technologies, uh, we gather um, a lot of interesting information and, and we, we try to consolidate that into a single point. Um, and we have a link on our homepage that, um, that has access to some of those white papers. So additional to those two duties, we also are responsible for maintaining the DOD commercial item database. And so the vision is to have all DOD commercial item determinations housed in one place in, instead of in thousands of different locations with thousands of different people that inevitably move on and that information gets lost. And, and so we are the single point and any DOD commercial item determination is required to be submitted for entry in this DOD commercial item database. So th this is relatively new, we're a couple of years old, so it's far from um, all inclusive of the SIDS that are out there that may date you know, 10, 15 years back, but, but certainly the push is to get all in one place so both industry and government can tap into a single source and understand what has already been reviewed and already been determined commercial. All right, so this is certainly oversimplified, but here are a couple of the major regulations that guide our reviews. So first and foremost, we have the FAR 2.101 commercial definitions. So recently, um, and I believe it was about October 2021, um, they were all 
defined as items. So both products and services had eight commercial definitions, one through eight. And um, in October, 2021, those were broken out into products and services. So this is a quick chart off on the right that demonstrates um, the new alignment between products and services and the old definitions. So key takeaway here is there was not a wholesale reinvention of these definitions. It was essentially reallocated into these two buckets from a single one. So secondly, the DFARS, it adds a couple layers of complexity and, and most notably is that a government contracting officer must document a commercial item determination for a product or service to be procured commercially under a DOD contract. And, and so <clears throat> beyond these, there's certainly a, a web of FARs and FAR and DFARs uh, regulations that govern what we look to, but these are the two main ones and just wanna point that out. All right, so tools and research, resources. I'll direct you to the bottom of the screen. So we got a web link here. This is our public website for the commercial item group. Um, you can also Google DCMA commercial item group and you'll get to the same link. But a, a couple things to point out to make um, you know, awareness of uh, what's out there is on the left here, we have a public SID repository for commercial item um, group SIDs. So that, that's what we re reviewed internally. This is an Excel spreadsheet that's searchable and you can go out at any time, download, look through this, this um, Excel spreadsheet and, and, and see what's been reviewed in the past. And then second, um, this is the DOD wide commercial item database for historical SIDs. And I referred to this um, slide or two back, but um, this is ultimately what is intended to be the comprehensive list of all DOD commercial item determinations. So off on the right, we have a couple links here to request support. This is primarily for our DOD customers. Uh, below that, we have some SIG process flows um, and, and charts, information about how we operate um, and, and how uh, information gets flowed within our group. We also have a uh, SIG feedback. So next slide, this is just further down on the public website. Um, we have um, helpful hints and tricks, how to register and maneuver within the commercial item database. We have some links on market research that can be very helpful. Some SIG white papers on how we do business and things that may be applicable to you. A labor rate analysis tool. We also have our templates listed here for our three main work products, which are the um, CPR, the CTAR, and the SID. So that's our technical analysis, our pricing report, and our commercial item determination. So I always find it helpful to know um, what the final work product will look like to make sure if you're in industry, you're addressing all the concerns and items that we're looking at when performing our reviews. So off to the right, we have our SIG case acceptance thresholds. So um, notably here, um, the TINA threshold over $2 million is typically what triggers um, DCMA SIG involvement if a customer requests. Um, there are exceptions where under $2 million, we will perform some level of service, a market research report or pricing analysis to some extent, but that's the general threshold that we work um, to. And then finally at the bottom, we have an office hours link. Um, so I'll talk to this in the next uh, upcoming slides here. All right, this is a screenshot of our SIG public repository. And we have um, a list of the part numbers and the descriptions across the board that can be searchable. They're listed as a status of commercial or other than commercial. And commercial items 
um, in order to be overturned, have to be approved by a higher level contracting authority, other than commercial can be reviewed at any time. Then we have some tools and resources for DAU, who we're a partner with on many of our um, um, opportunities and office hours. There's a link at the right um, for our director and deputy director. If you're interested in this information, uh, it's a good video. It's about nine minutes long. And then finally, we have our DCMA office hours. So this is our opportunity, you know, we're coming up against, I think I'm a minute over actually, but uh, we'll go through this real quick. You'll have these slides. And this is our opportunity to take any discussion offline and go in depth on any questions you might have. And so here's the link if you wanna be added to that list. And we do this every month on Thursday um, and we can answer any questions you might have. So um, got, got through real quick and sorry, I'm two minutes over, but uh, lots of information to discuss there. Hey, Scott, we appreciate you being here. That was really good information that you shared. Um, everybody, this, the information for more information slide is up there. You all will be receiving the slides after the event. So please do reach out to Scott uh, and DCMA if you have any questions. Um, everyone, please next, let's welcome GSA's own IDIQ Lab Innovation Sector Manager, Mr. Jim Galoni. Jim, please tell us about innovations and IDIQ contracting. Thanks, Where Mary. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can. You All look right. great. Thank Let you. Let me share my screen. All right, Mary, I can't see the chat anymore. So if you let me know that you can see this. I can. You awesome. are uh, actually, no, you are not sharing. It's still Adam. But if you need, if you want Adam to go, you can just go next slide if that works better. Oh, yeah. Can you, do you mind? No problem. Adam, 10-4. Okay, perfect. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So Quickly, uh, my name is Jim Galoni, and uh, I've spent uh, the vast majority of my career at GSA, 17 years from 2000 to 2000, I guess 17, 18, and I spent a few years in the private sector, and now I'm back at GSA. And in my uh, GSA career, I've had the wonderful opportunity to be a program manager for a number of large-scale IDIQs. I was the Alliant program manager, the original iteration of Alliant. I ran GSA's GWAC center for a number of years. I was the Oasis program manager when that contract was uh, awarded. And I'm now managing group that runs an internal GSA IDIQ called Astro. And so I've been around the IDIQ world for the vast majority of my career. And I was very excited when Mary and company asked me to spend a little time talking about some of the innovations we've seen over the last few years. Now, I know that some of our colleagues uh, from DHS's uh, Procurement Innovations Lab, the PIL, or either have been or will be speaking at this, and they do a lot of wonderful stuff uh, in terms of procurement innovation. And so uh, what I'm gonna talk about is certainly not all inclusive, and it's primarily focused sort of at the IDIQ level itself, though I'm happy to talk uh, if anybody has questions or wants to get into in the brief time we have together, how these um, innovations might apply at a task order level. So with that, uh, uh, if you could advance the slide, um, I'm gonna talk about innovations in terms of scope, uh, evaluation methodologies, pricing and industry engagement. And then I'm gonna try to leave time at the end for some questions. And certainly uh, now that someone is very helpfully advancing the slides for me, I can actually see the Q&A as it comes in. So um, in scope area, I think the major innovations in scope and these are not necessarily, you know, innovation is what's the time statute of limitations on innovation. I don't wanna debate that, but uh, I will say that, that the scope of IDIQ, certainly the government-wide IDIQs I've been involved with have become increasingly flexible and broadly defined. I think as a government, we realize that innovation and uh, requirements are changing at a rapid pace and narrowly defined scope uh, really just restricts the ability of the government to deliver a correct and total solution to 
the people executing our mission. Uh, Lyant, one of the, the breakthroughs there, innovations, and this is a little out of date, so innovation's a stretch, please forgive me, but the concept of defining the scope around a common methodology or a framework, in this case for Alliant, the federal enterprise architecture, really enabled as a contracting organization to define what we wanted at a high enough flexible level that you could define what IT in this case is for purposes of having a, a you know definable scope but it was broad enough that you didn't need to do constant tech refreshes. When I, very early in my career, we were doing annual tech refreshes, adding dozens, if not hundreds of labor categories on a regular basis. And it was just a lot of administrative paperwork, bureaucracy, we're not really adding any value to the end customer. Uh, and so this notion of using some sort of commonly understood framework um, or architecture to define a broad scope area. And then the other, I think, scope innovation, which really allows for that delivery of complex total solutions for end users is the explicit inclusion of ancillary products and services, whether that's minor construction alteration and repair, uh, service contract act labor, uh, products on a primarily, you know, solutions, services-based contract, uh, providing the contracting officer at the task order level with the flexibility that they need and frankly, trusting that contracting officer to make an appropriate determination about what they need to include in a statement of work to capture a total solution so that we're fulfilling requirements in a single task rather than trying to manage multiple contracts with various contractors, different timelines, different deliverable schedules, et cetera. Uh, I think so in, in the notion of, of using an IDIQ contract putting as much definite in the indefinite as we can, but providing COs with that flexibility to really enable them to, to get the solution that they need to meet their mission requirements is uh, a huge innovation. Uh, you know, when I started, a lot of these IDIQ contracts were very narrowly scoped. And like I said, had frequent, you know, tech refreshes or mods or, or continual updates. And it was just a, a much more a uh, burdensome, ex burdensome experience, I think, on both ends for both the customers using the contract and industry offering on it. Uh, so moving forward, I think some of the more interesting, more recent uh, uh, innovations and in evaluation methodology. Uh, having done Alliant, I can tell you, we got a protest, we lost, we had to, <laughs> you know, uh, go back to square one. And, and one of the lessons really took away from that that informed the future vehicles that I did from that point forward, including Oasis and, and now on to others, is that at the IDIQ level, the challenge for the evaluator is there's no actual requirement. There's a huge array of potential requirements, particularly in these broadly scoped vehicles we just discussed. But what are you evaluating at the IDIQ level, right? Competition for specific requirements is gonna occur at a task order level. So at the IDAQ level, what we're essentially evaluating is we're making a prediction about future success. How likely are the companies we do going to successfully be able to deliver the products, services, and solutions that we're going to need over the next five to 10 years? And uh, as Section 876 now lets you not even do pricing. It gives you a waiver from doing pricing at the IDIQ level. Certainly a huge innovation. Uh, but even before that, we really understood the, the need to kind of minimize the focus on price at an IDIQ level. In, in my experience, things like ceiling rates uh, often are a crutch. You know, a CEO uh, that's, you know, not been particularly well trained may say, well, it's a dollar less than the ceiling, therefore it must be fair and reasonable. But those ceiling rates are based on, you know, top level security clearances, you know, downtown San Francisco, contractor site, you know, the most expensive conditions, just because something is under a ceiling doesn't mean it's fair and reasonable. And so that's sort of a, almost a crutch uh, in a lot of cases. And so we really have strived to minimize the impact. So to that end, the highest technically rated with acceptable pricing approach, which I would categorize as the opposite end of the spectrum from LPTA, it's all best value. Uh, but, you know, what's that spectrum? Well, one end, obviously it's, you know, technically acceptable with a, and we're focused really on the price. At the other end, and I'd say the more useful end at the IDIQ level, we're really focused on the technical capabilities and we're gonna validate if we must pricing, though of course now you can uh, potentially use that 876 authority to 
um, not even look at pricing because again, pricing is meaningful at a task order level where there's a specific requirement. Uh, people often conflate a scorecard approach with highest technically rated with acceptable pricing. They are not the same thing. They do go well together, peanut butter and jelly, if you will, but you know they are separate and can be deployed separately. The, the value of a, a scorecard approach, again, you see on CIOSP4 recently, uh, uh, on Polaris up to come, it seems. I think there's still some revisions in the RFP I don't know anything about, but I believe they're using a scorecard methodology, certainly on Oasis and Astro, we used a scorecard methodology. Uh, this really is trying to minimize the subjectivity of the process. If you look at where government loses protests and why it's often an inconsistent application of processes or uh, an insertion of opinion uh, in the absence of data, and so the minimizing the subjectivity and evaluation process, focusing on objectively verifiable criteria, establishing either a baseline score or, or a set number of awards you want to make and using a sort of scorecard approach to that uh, has been very successful in reducing successful protests, reducing bias and inconsistency, which I would say is the reason there's not successful protests because it fosters a more objective and defensible process. Now we've learned that scorecards can be gamed. Uh, it's easy for you know potentially you know companies that have never done anything together to sort of band together to maximize their score and inject a lot of risk on the government end because again companies that have no working relationship or really anything other than sort of a mercenary marriage of convenience to maximize a scorecard. Uh, this uh, you know is a challenge. It's something that isn't oh you know it's not insurmountable. But it's something to keep in mind. And I think this is a methodology that is evolving over time. It's evolving as some of the regulations around CTAs, for example, are evolving uh, around uh, priorities in terms of the industrial base. Uh, but, you know, it's not the be all end all. It's a tool. All of these things I'm talking about are, are things that can be used when it makes sense. Uh, no one size fits all, especially in government contracting. Um, Establishing just as a benefit of sort of a scorecard approach, um, it really facilitates on ramping because you have again an objectively defined and verifiable and defensible criteria for award that then facilitates a much more um, easy on ramp process because you say, hey, here's the bar. If you're over, you're in. If you're not, you're not, as opposed to sort of the black box that surrounds more traditional procurement and sort of a more traditional trade-off analysis. And for industry, at least the feedback I've received over the years that while the level of effort to put together a proposal here is very different than a traditional proposal, that they appreciate the ability to understand exactly how they're being scored as opposed to receiving sort of a nebulous color or adjectival rating with minimal explanation of what that meant. Uh, let's go, next slide. I see there's some questions queued up. I'll, I'll just get through get a couple more slides, then I'll dive into any of those questions. Uh, around pricing, I think the two main, I referred to the sort of second point here earlier, the two biggest innovations uh, are around ceilings and around pricing at the contract level. Uh, I took Jason Miller of Federal News Network to task uh, last week when I saw him because he said that uh, Polaris and Oasis Plus are going to be the first government-wide contracts with no ceiling. And I reminded him that Oasis uh, did this 10 years ago um, and he had already put a correction in. So kudos to him, he's a wonderful person. Uh, but uh, the challenge with the, you know, the purpose of a ceiling, I think we know is to give industry an idea of sort of what will be coming so that they can appropriately scope a level of effort and staff and prepare to meet whatever the requirement is. That is kind of meaningless at an IDIQ level, especially for a government-wide contract. A contract is incredibly successful. I look at like 8A Stars uh, or Alliance Small Business or Alliant 2 contracts recently that uh, uh, have kind of been bumping up against ceilings. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody that won those contracts was not going to bid if the ceiling had been a billion dollars lower than it was. Um, you know, and so you know, for Oasis and sort of now future GSA, GWACs at least, we've been getting that deviation, a far deviation from the senior procurement executive to not have a ceiling because it's really adding nothing of interest to industry. And it, what it does is it forces uh, us to recompete things ahead of schedule, which is in pretty much bad for industry as far as I understand it. 
at least for the people that won. Um, and it certainly is a stress on our contracting staff, right? So why are we handcuffing ourselves and you know putting roadblocks in front of our own success? If we build a vehicle that's incredibly successful, then let's let it run its course and then we recompete in the natural cycle of things rather than having to scramble to you know, Diob funds off expired task orders so that new customers can get what they need. Uh, that again, an exercises in inefficiency that I've experienced on the other end. Uh, and then we talked earlier about pricing at the IDOQ level. I firmly believe that pricing at the IDOQ level is meaningless. If there is not a real requirement, what are you pricing? You give people say, well, give them a sample requirement. I would tell you that uh, that's not representative of all the work that will be done on any broadly scoped IDIQ anyway. And frankly, if it's a, a, a made up requirement, you get made up pricing. So uh, strongly encourage folks to look into that NDAA 876 authority uh, to remove pricing at the IDIQ level. Now you do need to provide some data to contracting officers. GSA, we use labor categories based on the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and that gives us access to a data set we're also collecting prices paid data and we'll be making that available. So there is data, uh, but you know, cost is cost and DCAA, if a previous speaker could attest, uh, is more than happy to provide information that'll help you assess cost rates. Uh, and um, you know, if you're getting competition, you already have a basis for fair and reasonable pricing, again, at the task order level where it's meaningful. Uh, we did this, the first case of this was on our Astro IDIQ I referenced before. I'll tell you, we have exactly one data point. We've had one task order uh, where we've had bids submitted, but we got more competition on that than we have on any similar task order on any other vehicle we've done. So the one single data point from which we cannot really derive much, uh, at least we had increased competition uh, and we didn't have any significant complaints from industry. For the IDIQ itself, the data we received from our offerers was they saved up to 40% of their BMP costs. Uh, it was significantly cheaper for offer an average of $60,000 cheaper to bid the contract uh, because they did not have to do pricing at the IDIQ level, which translates to about $10 million saved, which ultimately is taxpayer money because we know all of those costs get passed on in the form of indirects to the government eventually. So uh, early, re early returns are it's 876 is doing exactly what we want it to do. It's minimizing a burden on industry. It's eliminating inefficient, pointless processes on the government side and uh, with no negative impact observed so far. Yeah, I see a comment. Astro is for not just warfighters, potentially civilian, but it's platform related services. So if you can imagine the Forest Service wants to have a fleet of drones flying over forest fires and reporting back, uh, that kind of work would be done under Astro potentially, in addition to sort of all the manned and unmanned platforms you can imagine for DOD. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, engagement. I mentioned the black box earlier. Uh, and, you know, as with anything, you know, having now been in the private sector for a few years doing exactly GovCon, you know, capture and proposal work, um, fear, uncertainty, and doubt lead to protests. Industry protests to get information because they don't understand why something happened. Now, sometimes there are other reasons. I'm saying that's for everything, but for a lot of protests, it's driven by uncertainty. And so uh, as we build out an IDIQ, we're having extensive conversations with our customers and we're sharing our rationale publicly with industry. Uh, on Oasis, every major procurement decision we made, I put a blog up publicly explaining why we made the decision we did, what customer needs drove the decision. It doesn't mean everybody agreed with the decisions, but at least they understood why we made it. And again, eliminating that uncertainty, fear, and doubt, uh, and letting people know that these are conscious decisions, not some diabolical scheme or some oversight or mistake, was very helpful. And frankly, uh, uh, we were very successful in protests because often the accusation in a protest at GAO or what they're looking for is, is it arbitrary? And when I could walk in with meeting minutes from various customer working groups and say, no, this is why we did what we did. Our customers asked for it. We validated it. You explained it, that made it very uh, defensible. And so, you know, on Oasis, for example, no protests were successful at the initial Oasis Award. I think 36 and 0 was the record on that one. And on Astro, no protest even made it to the point of getting to a decision. They were all withdrawn by the protester uh, very early in. So this has been very effective, posting both information on our, in GSA's case, on our Interact platform, 
uh, which I'm sure you can learn more about from the helpful people running this show. Uh, and also, again, uh, meeting with our customers to validate all the decisions we were making. The last uh, major innovation, more recent, that I, I want to highlight here before I get to some of the Q&A is something we did on Astro, which really vastly improved the entire process, is we made, I think, frankly, an unprecedented offer. This was a scorecard. Um, and you know the, the, the evaluation on a scorecard effectively is validating the submission, right? Industry submits uh, self-scores and submits supporting documentation to validate all the scoring elements. And the government's evaluation process is effectively validating those documents and claims. What we offered for any company that was interested based on the drafts, you know, we would put out a draft and we would say, if you wanna submit a draft proposal in response to our draft RFP, we'll take a look at it and we'll let you know where we would see issues. Uh, and it highlighted areas on our solicitation that needed clarification or improvement. We could see the common mistakes the industry was making. It's not our goal to have people be not compliant. We want compliant bids because that's better for competition. And so we could see kind of how industry was interpreting our words and our language, where we had gaps. It also helped them understand that, for example, you know, just because you're doing work for the Navy chief financial officer, that's not platform support. The CFO of the Navy is not operating a ship or a platform of any sort. That would not be allowable and we would throw it out and they would know that and they could correct that before we get to the final uh, RFP. Now, of course, once the final is out, none of that happens. It's official. We're in the formal acquisition process. But frankly, until the final RFP is on the street, everything is market research and everything is up for grabs, as long as you're fair and consistent. And we were. We took this from anybody that offered it. Uh, we turned them all around pretty quickly. And we the result was well-informed industry partners giving us compliant and well-designed bids that we could evaluate knowing that we were seeing sort of exactly the picture that we wanted to see and not having to throw out otherwise highly qualified companies because of a, a technicality for compliance or allowing companies to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars of bid and proposal money on something they really had no chance of winning in the first place, right? This engagement with industry. Now, this isn't, again, none of these are always the right answer for anything, right? Your mileage will vary. I'm not saying everybody should do this on all bids. And certainly, you know, it's much easier in a scorecard environment than in a traditional, uh, you know, tech management, staffing, evaluation, best value determination. But just uh, where possible, uh, I just wanted to show the, this out there as something that was very effective in this specific case. And I think it's just another example of uh, open communication, sort of opening the kimono as much as possible for industry throughout an acquisition process really leads to much better outcomes, not just from industry's perspective, but from a government perspective, again, in getting better bids, compliant bids, more qualified bids, getting more competition. Industry sees you engaging and sees you communicating. It makes them more willing to put a bid in rather than if they perceive that it's a black box, that it's wired, you know, they've got no chance, they don't understand what's happening you know, that restricts competition fundamentally. So uh, I think, you know, this is all, yeah, again, I didn't put a time limit on innovation. You look back at Mythbusters, however many years ago that was, uh, and the, you know, driving engagement with industry and government. None of this is, there's nothing new under the sun, but these are just some of the particular techniques that I've seen very effectively used in the IDIQ space. So we got about five minutes left. Uh, let me pop up the Q&A here. Um, Let's see, uh, schedule 70 vendors. I'd say most of what I talked about is not really related to schedules at all. Uh, I know schedules are technically IDIQs, but uh, I was really talking to a non-mass uh, audience. Um, Oasis SB on-ramp, I have no idea if they're going to do an on-ramp. I don't believe that an on-ramp is in the works. They just did one or there is one still happening. Are still being evaluated, but uh, Oasis is the, the the shift is to Oasis Plus. Uh, if you're looking at Oasis SB, I would say instead start paying attention to Oasis Plus, which was previously the Services Mac, and before that the Big Mac. It's had a couple names, but we've settled on Oasis Plus, and uh, you'll be seeing uh, ongoing information about that moving forward. 
Uh, and so if you're interested in kind of getting involved in the OASIS program, that's going to be the point of entry. Uh, Astro IDIQ solicitation. Uh, yeah, it's up on SAM. You can find it. You can also go to, uh, I think if you go to, uh, I want to say aas.gsa.gov slash Astro uh, on our public website, you can find the contract and the contract holders and all that information. Uh, if you just want to take a look at it to see how it worked. Uh, and if you're a contracting person and you want to sort of have a conversation about some more details, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I don't think, Derek, to look at your question, uh, I'll, uh, we'll get the posted, uh, the, the email address. I don't want to say it again because I might not be right. <laughs> um, I don't think eliminating pricing at the IDIQ level changes task order execution at all. Uh, because if you think about it, if, you know, I'll pick on, uh, uh, we'll say Oasis, right? Oasis had task order, our uh, IDIQ level pricing. It was specifically sole source TNM but there was pricing. But if you're doing a cost contract, for example, which is a lot of the work that we're talking about on non-mass contracts is, is cost, you have to do all the things, whether there's contract level pricing or not, right? You've got to look at provisional rates. You've got to look at all the DCAA documentation and, and uh, 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 you know, validate all of that anyway. Um, if it's competitive, you're still going to do the same you know, trade-off analysis. So I would argue that um, uh, there really is no or minimal additional work uh, involved in uh, evaluating a task order uh, that has is unpriced. But that's anecdotal. Uh, it's based on 20 years of experience doing this, but it is anecdotal. We are capturing PALT data on Astro, and I'm sure the Polaris folks will as well to the extent that they can uh, as we do these unpriced contracts to validate that. And I think if we find that it is increasing difficulty, we'll certainly have to make some adjustments. But I can tell you, we don't just put contracting officers at the task order level out on an island. We have pricing tools that, again, will reference like BLS data and other data sources that they can use to execute uh, a price or cost analysis at the task order level. Um, do, 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 conduct hot expenses. Yes, Andrea, that would be, I would say, you know, the single line you've given, I think, is in scope. That's not official, but yeah, that kind of thing. Um, except that Astro is an IDIQ, so you could do a task order for HUD that could do inspections for public and multifamily housing. Absolutely. Uh, that would be a great use of the contract, frankly. That's what it's designed for. Uh, Oasis Plus will be released. Uh, I'm not, that's not in my pay grade to talk about Oasis Plus's timeline. Uh, I know that there have been some articles about it recently, and I'm sure they're going to be very forthcoming. Let me plug Interact uh, again, especially for our industry partners that are on the line, but certainly for uh, any of our customers, government customers, GSA's Interact, interact.gsa.gov, has communities of interest or pages or blogs, whatever they are, devoted to a variety of our acquisition programs. And we're very good, typically, at posting information there, along with SAM.gov and other places for public knowledge. And so and you can subscribe and get a notice. Uh, thanks, Chanda, that's the, the, the link is in the chat, but you'll get kind of a proactive notice when a posting goes up and you can go in and if you're allowed to, you can comment uh, and see some of that uh, information there. So uh, I loved Interact when I was doing uh, my last IDIQ, it was incredibly helpful to, to both receive and share information, so. Uh, I'm sure Oasis Plus will make good use of it. All right. I think I got our two minutes back. We got another minute. Any final questions popping up? If not, uh, anybody, again, feel free to reach out to me if you have more questions. Otherwise, I'm going to turn it back to Mary. Uh, Jim, hey, it's Shonda. Thank you so much. That was very, um, very insightful and always, always enjoy listening to you speak about IDIQs and other things as well. So we really appreciate you being here and um, appreciate your the way you have um, molded IDIQ contracting and the way that we think about it these days. So, so thank you very much. Uh, Mary, Is I think we, we have a poll maybe and uh, then maybe a break. So let me execute, I believe we have um, one poll um, similar to the ones we've had uh, earlier this week on the other days. Please let us know if you would like to learn more about any of the following sessions, things we've talked about already today, the future of the federal workforce, DCMA commercial item group, 
or innovations in IDIQ contracting that Jim just shared with us. Um, we will capture this and use this information uh, to plan for future monthly uh, contracting um, training events um, and then our, our fast three day event that we'll have coming up in the, the next FY. I'm gonna end the poll. We've had about half of you respond. I'm gonna share the results. It looks like we've got a lot of folks interested in the future of the workforce and uh, more, more about these innovative approaches for IDIQ contracting from Jim. So thank you all for your participation and your um, paying attention this far and being interactive with our speakers and the Chatterfall and otherwise. And Mary, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thanks, Shonda. And thanks, Jim Galoni. That was a great session, very informative. I, I was riveted. Uh, before continuing the program, we are going to take about a 15 minute break, 14 minutes actually. So if y'all can be back here at 2.45, that would be wonderful. And we will continue our program with uh, information on the DHS Procurement Innovation Lab. So more information to enhance your journey in uh, acquisitions. Enjoy your break and we'll see you back at 2.45.